Dear loving Father in heaven, glory be unto your name for the privilege of life. As your coming draws near, O Lord, we want to prepare ourselves that we may be ready to meet you. For the sake of the death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, we ask, Lord, please may these words that will be spoken now be inspired from above. We pray, Father, please put your words in my mouth that you may use this devotion to prepare us for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please, Father, grant us of your spirit, grant us understanding, quicken our hearts, grant us zeal that we may do exactly what you want us to do in preparation for that day. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Conflict and Courage, March 4 Power Guaranteed As a prince has thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. Genesis chapter 32 verse 28 Had not Jacob previously repented of his sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud, God could not have heard his prayer and mercifully preserved his life. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed, despair would cut off their faith, and they would and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they will have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins will have been blotted out by the atoning blood of Christ, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven, unconfessed and unforgiven, will be overcome by Satan. The more exalted their profession, and the more honorable the position which they hold, the more grievous is their cause in the sight of God, and the more certain the triumph of the great adversary. Yet, Jacob's history is an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been betrayed into sin but who have returned unto him with true repentance. It was by self-surrender and confiding faith that Jacob gained what he had failed to gain by conflict in his own strength. God thus taught his servant that divine power and grace alone could give him the blessing he craved. Thus it will be with those who live in the last days. As dangers surround them, and despair seizes upon the soul, they must depend solely upon the merits of the atonement. None will ever perish while they do this. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. It is now that we are to learn this lesson of prevailing prayer, of unyielding faith. The greatest victories to the Church of Christ or to the individual Christian are not those that are gained by talent or education, by wealth or the favor of men. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God, when earnest agonizing faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. Amen. The title of our devotion for today is power guaranteed. Our key text is taken from the book of Genesis chapter 32 verse 28 which says, As a prince has thou power with God and with men and has prevailed. We are looking at the type of the time of trouble which Jacob passed through. What Jacob experienced which is called Jacob's time of trouble is a type of something that is going to take place in the future. The Bible, like we saw yesterday, prophesies 
that there is going to be a time of Jacob's trouble. This is a time that is just before the coming of Jesus and we looked into into it in detail in our devotion yesterday. You see, before the coming of Jesus, there are things that are supposed to take place. In the book of Matthew chapter 24, reading verse 14, Jesus himself said these words, and this gospel of the of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. What gospel of the kingdom is being referred to here? In Revelation 14, reading verse 6, John said, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every kindred and nation and tongue and people. So, Jesus said there is a gospel that will preach before the end comes, and that is the gospel of the kingdom. John says he saw an angel having that gospel of the kingdom. So what is the content of this gospel? We read in verse 7, 8, 9, 10 to 12 of Revelation 14, the content of this gospel. It is this gospel that will be preached and then the end will come. But this gospel has a work. In Matthew 24 verse 14, Jesus actually said that it's going to be for a witness to the world. That is, so that everybody must have heard and had a chance to make a choice. And like we saw yesterday, not until everybody has heard and had a chance to make a choice will Jesus end his work in the most holy place, interceding for our sins and then he will come. But there is a second thing that this gospel is going to do. As we saw yesterday, the third angel's message, if you read Revelation 14, like I just read verse 6 now, verse 7 talks about the first angel's message, which says that a judgment time is going on as we speak. The world is being judged. That message says, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of judgment is come and worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And the second message says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And then the third message is the most important of them. We, we looked into it a bit yesterday. It talks about the mark of the beast, saying that anyone who receives the mark of the beast will, just simply put, will have God's wrath without mixture. And then we see that that same third angel's message develops a kind of people. In verse 12, the message, when this message is preached, this message, this gospel of the kingdom, which part of it is the third angel's message, it does a work which must be done before Jesus will come. And I'll talk about what that work is. It is a work that we see in Revelation 7 verse 1 to 3. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Do you understand what that statement is? That means Christ is not going to come until this work is done. The four winds of the earth, which the angels were about to let loose, represents God giving the earth over to its own self, that is like we saw yesterday, that is for Satan, the spirit of the Lord will be removed from the earth and then the devil will be in control, but then Christ will come. Is the destruction of this earth, that is what that is. But before the destruction, God says, I am doing a work and that is to seal my servants in their forehead. Now fast forward, Revelation 14, the third angel's message, verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints, here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. These are the people that are sealed. The gospel of the kingdom is going to develop a people 
that will be like Jesus, that will keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It is these people that their power is guaranteed. They are the ones who will pass through that Jacob's time of trouble. In fact, they are the Jacobs. Just put it that way. They are the Jacobs that will pass through a time of trouble just as Jacob of old passed through a time of trouble. And God is developing these people. And not until he has finished this work will the end come. But when this work is done, then the end will come. Reading from Great Controversy, page 613 uh, down to 614. Talking about when this work is done, an angel comes to Jesus and says the work is done. He lifts his hand, that is Jesus lifts his hands and with a loud voice says it is done. And all the angelic hosts lay off their crowns as he makes the solemn announcement. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22 verse 11 Every case has been decided for life or death. Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The number of his subjects is made. Remember Revelation 7 verse 3 where Jesus said, Hurt not the earth till I have sealed the uh, servants of God in their forehead. And verse 4 said, And I heard the number of them that were sealed. 144,000. Now in great controversy, as I'm reading page 613, paragraph 2 there, it says the number of his subjects is made up. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is about to be given to the heirs of salvation. And Jesus is to reign as the king of kings. I'll pause here for a while before I continue reading. Something we saw just here, a very solemn message that Jesus says. At this time, there is no more repentance for anyone because the Spirit of God has been withdrawn from the earth. Therefore, any way you are, that's how you will be forever. That is why Jesus says, Revelation 22 verse 11, He that is unjust, you are going to stay that way forever. If this time comes, which is called the close of probation for man, that is the general close of probation for the whole world where Jesus ceases to intercede and is now coming to the earth. Contrary to what is being taught among most of uh, Christendom, that there is going to be another chance, that there will be some people taken away and then some will be left behind and then they will have another chance. There is no other chance for anybody when, once Jesus comes. There is no second chance. Now is our second chance. There is no third chance. We lost it before through Adam and God is giving us a second chance. And whenever we sin, he forgives us, even gives us more than second chance and so many chances he gives to us. It is not when he comes and then he's going to give another chance. It is going to be over. Anyone who is unjust will be unjust still. Anyone who is filthy will be filthy still. And those who are righteous and holy will remain that way. But how do you know where you will be? This is what this time of trouble is about. And that is why some people among the, those who will be on the earth will have their power guaranteed to them during this time. Continuing the reading in Great Controversy, he says, When Jesus leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan, take note, Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. There is no third chance. I continue the reading. God's long suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. Wow. The Spirit of God persistently resisted has been at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by divine grace, they have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. End of quote. 
Now, at this time when the whole world is involved, remember that uh, the, the world is already choosing to be in the wrong side. When they see their calamity and their trouble, which the devil himself is plunging them into, the devil himself will still instigate them to say that it is God's people, those who are keeping the commandments, are the ones who are causing the problem. Oh, climate change. There was a movie done not long ago that's titled Tomorrow Wars. There, climate change was not an issue of climate, actually. It was an issue of some aliens who were Sabbath keepers, some aliens that were like they say they rest every sabbath day every seventh day they keep the sabbath white spike hmm. white spikes right oh alluding to Ellen white then they, they, even satan knows what he's about to do he knows that that's what he's going to do he's going to point to these sabbath keepers in that movie tomorrow wars it was the sabbath keepers that had they were aliens on this earth very insignificant aliens they're not from here that's what they're trying to say they are the ones that caused the climate change it is not necessarily about resting on Sunday because at that time, resting and the breaking of the law of God and the resting on Sunday is not going to solve the problem of climate change. The world is proposing today, oh, we need to rest on rest one day of the week, not just one day, Sunday, so that we can solve the problem of climate change, so that we can solve the problem of terrorism. But all, every kind of problem, Sunday is, Sunday is the solution. But then it will be, it will be seen that Sunday is not the solution. And then they will point to these people that keep the commandments of God and say, these are the problem of the world. Then there will be a time of trouble for God's people. How are they going to go through this time? Great Controversy, page 616, paragraph 1 says, The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. Thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. End of quote. Now, I remember that even somewhere it is said that these people of God are going to even get offended with themselves saying if i knew that this is how the trouble was going to be i would have held my peace and not even speak that's how bad it's going to be at that time now the prophecy in jeremiah chapter 30 verse 5 to 7 which i just read said it's going to be a time of jacob's trouble but he shall be delivered out of it in other words power is going to be given to him but how is he going to get the victory we need to know it today it is not then that the power is going to be given to us. If we are not doing what we are supposed to be doing now, we will not get the victory then. So let us see how the victory is gotten. In Great Controversy, page 616, paragraph 2, we read, Jacob's night of anguish when he wrestled in prayer for deliverance from the hand of Esau represents the experience of God's people in the time of trouble. Because of the deception practiced to secure his father's blessing intended for Esau, Jacob had fled for his life, alarmed by his brother's deadly threats. After remaining for years in exile, he had set out at God's command to return with his wives and children, his flocks and herds, to his native country. On reaching the borders of the land, he was filled with terror by the tidings of Esau's approach at the head of a band of warriors, doubtless bent upon revenge. Jacob's company, unarmed and defenseless, seemed about to fall helpless victims of violence and slaughter. And to the burden of anxiety and fear was added the crushing weight of self-reproach, for it was his own sin that had brought this danger. His only hope was in the mercy of God, his only defense must be prayer. And then it says, yet he leaves nothing undone on his own part to atone for the wrong to his brother and to avert the threatened danger. A lesson is here. So should the followers of Christ, as they approach the time of trouble, make every exertion to place themselves in a proper light before the people, to disarm prejudice, and to avert the danger which threatens liberty of conscience end of quote 
now a lesson is here learned for us if we must be victorious at this time we must place ourselves in the best light that doesn't mean you should disobey god's commandments show care show, show compassion for the people at that time when there is trouble the people of god shouldn't be indifferent towards the suffering of humanity they should do all they can to help not because they are pretending to show people who oh, i love I, i'm in a great light please have mercy on me but out of genuine concern out of genuine compassion for a world that is perishing or about to perish forever the people of god are to do all they can to help at this time to disarm prejudice so continue the reading it says as satan accuses the people of god on account of their sins the lord permits him to try them to the uttermost their confidence is in god their faith and firmness will be severely tested so what is the tra- time of trouble about it is not about people coming to kill these people of god that is not what their trouble is going to be about we will see that in the reading let me continue reading it says their confidence in god take note their faith and their firmness will be severely tested why is satan testing their faith of all things to do why not bring persecution upon them why trouble their faith why why is that we'll find out as they review the past their hopes sink for in their whole lives they can see little good they are fully conscious of their weakness and unworthiness satan endeavors to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless that the stain of their defilement will never be washed away he hopes so to destroy their faith once again satan wants to destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to god it says though god's people will be surrounded by enemies who are bent upon their destruction yet the anguish which they suffer is not a dread of persecution for the truth's sake they fear that every sin has not been repented of and that through some fault in themselves they will fail to realize the fulfillment of the savior's promise what is the promise the promise is this i will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world revelation chapter 3 verse 10 if they could have the assurance of pardon they would not shrink from torture or death but should they prove unworthy and lose their lives because of their own defects of character then god's holy name will be reproached on every hand they hear the plottings of treason and see the active working of rebellion and there is aroused within them an intense desire an earnest yearning of soul that this great apostasy may be terminated and the wickedness of the wicked may come to an end but while they plead with god to stay the work of rebellion it is with a keen sense of self-reproach that they themselves have no more power to resist and urge back the mighty tide of evil they feel that had they always employed all their ability in the service of christ going forward from strength to strength satan's forces would have less power to prevail against them before i go on in this reading understand what the trouble is about this trouble is not about persecution god's people at this time are not worried about that that is a secondary issue satan is attacking their faith bringing their sins before their minds just as he did to jacob so that is why it's called jacob's time of trouble when jacob was in that affliction that night when he was in that struggle that night what was brought to his mind were his sins and he felt that what was happening to him was because of his sins of the past how did jacob overcome he struggled and struggled and struggled all the night but it could not do him any good but when he remembered his sins oh he was weak but then he remembered also that he had repented he had asked god for forgiveness of his sins and then he leaned on god's mercy and he pleaded with god to have mercy on him pointing to his repentance and that was how he got strength this is how his power was guaranteed he had faith in the forgiving power of god and he leaned he, he leaned on god's uh, forgiveness he leaned on god's mercies and also knowing that he had repented of his sins he had power the reading goes on to say they afflict their souls before god pointing to their past repentance of their many sins and pleading the savior's promise let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me isaiah 27 verse 5 remember satan is attacking their faith now it says their faith does not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered 
those suffering the keenest anxiety, terror, and distress, they do not cease their intercessions. They lay hold of the strength of God as Jacob laid hold of the angel, and the language of their souls is, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. So where does their victory come from? It is faith. Satan seeks to attack their faith, but it is that same faith that is their victory. This is how they overcome. How will we overcome in a time of trouble? The same way Joseph overcame, Jacob overcame. How did Jacob overcome? Like every saint has overcome and must overcome. How is that? By faith. 1 John 5 verse 4 tells us, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So how can we have faith? We need to cultivate faith today, not then. Those who have not learned to cultivate faith today will come to the time of trouble unable to exercise faith and will find it a difficult matter to overcome. And if you have not been exercising faith before that day, therefore you have not been overcoming your sins. Your sins will still be with you and then you will fall into despair. We will go back to that. But for those who will overcome, it is by faith. Romans 10 verse 17 tells us, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What is this faith we are talking about here? And how will it help if Satan is reminding you of all your sins? How does faith assist you? Since the time of trouble is Satan attacking their faith, how? By reminding them of their past sins in detail, telling them everything they have done, giving them the mind as if they have never been forgiven of their sins and making them to think that all this trouble you are passing through, you have not eaten for some days. You are rejected of the world. The world has outrightly thrown you away. You cannot buy or sell. Look at you staying in the mountains, no place to lay your head. You are in poverty. All this is because of your sins. Are you not seeing all that is happening around you? See all the people that want to kill you. It is because of your sins the Lord has forsaken you. It is just as Jesus was on the cross as the people surrounded him and the darkness enveloped Jesus. There was a time when darkness and earthquake came and the darkness enveloped only Jesus. And at that time, it felt as if the Lord had forsaken him and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So it will be for the people of God at this time. The people who are surrounding them will look like an evidence the Lord has left you. The fact that they are in distress and keen poverty and hunger will be like an evidence that the Lord has left them. Even people will be saying to them, is it not because of your sins that this is happening to you? At that time, what will they plead at this time? That is what the time of trouble is about. Many will fall at this time feeling that the Lord has forsaken them. And because of that, they will not be able to exercise faith and will have a very hard time. But then, the people who will overcome are those that know how to exercise faith. How will faith help at this time? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Galatians 3 tells us something about what it means to have faith. In Galatians 3 verse 1 and 2, reading King James Version there, Paul said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith is a question. In the New English translation, it says, The only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? That is what faith is. Believing what you heard. How will believing what we have heard help us in the time of trouble? I have heard. Faith tells me that I should believe what I heard from God because what I heard from him is powerful and is true. Faith hears what that if he confesses and forsakes his sin, he will be forgiven. Faith believes that if he confesses he will and forsakes his sins, then he will be forgiven. Then faith acts on this and then confesses and forsakes the sin. Faith then does not go back to his sins depending on the word of God to keep him. Faith believes he is forgiven. At that time, they will have to exercise faith in their past repentance and also in the promise of God that says, He that confesses his sins shall receive forgiveness. And when they remember, I have confessed my sin, and they review their lives and they cannot see 
any sin in their lives, they will hold on to God strongly like Jacob did, believing that they are forgiven. Even though they are not delivered from the present distress, they will still hold on to God's mercies, believing that even though, yes, it is true, they are reminded of their sins. Yes, I did commit this sin, but I'm not doing it anymore. I have forsaken it. I have repented of it. And that is why anyone who comes to this time with a sin on the books of heaven against them, unrepented of, they will fail in the time of trouble. Great Controversy, page 620, paragraph 3 says, Those professed Christians who come up to that, to that last fearful conflict unprepared will in their despair confess their sins. That means they didn't confess it before. They will confess their sins in words of burning anguish while the wicked exult over their distress. These confessions are of the same character as was that of Esau or of Judah. So wait, what this is telling us is that among the people who are going to be pleading, who the people are going to be coming after, there are going to be some of them who have not confessed their sins. So it's not that everybody at this time are going to be 144,000 sealed. No, there are going to be some people who have not confessed their sins at this time and the wicked will be coming after them. So there's going to be a mixed multitude. That's what it means. Among this mixed multitude, there's going to be those who are truly sealed, they will not know. And those who are sealed and those who are not sealed, they also will not know. Nobody's going to know at this time. But then what will make us know is that at this time, there are some people who will start confessing their sins. They have not forsaken it. But there is no room for confession at that time. Continuing the reading, it says, Those who make them, that's these confessions, lament the result of transgression but not its guilt. They feel no true contrition, no abhorrence of evil. They acknowledge their sin through fear of punishment. But like Pharaoh of old, they would return to their defiance of heaven should the judgments be removed. Brothers and sisters, have you confessed your sins? Have you forsaken them? This is a question I am asking myself. Should I come to that time of trouble with unconfessed sin? I'm still loving it. Here it says that the problem with these people is they, had, they don't abhor sin. They don't hate it. They love it. They still engage in it. They feel no true contrition nor abhorrence of evil. They are contr- The only thing that is making them afraid now is a punishment. Where there to be no punishment, they don't hate it. They love it. What is it that you love that is part of this world? Oh my, may the Lord help us. Are you still engaged in something in this world? You love it. The only thing you are the only reason you are running away from it is just because of the punishment. If we come to the time of trouble, we will still continue in our sins and maybe we will make confessions at that time, but it will be too little too late. The Lord wants us to have that faith to believe what we hear today and exercise faith to overcome our sins today. Now, in the time of Jacob's trouble, just as Jacob was reminded of his sins, the people of God were reminded of their sins so vividly that they will despair to think that God has forsaken them. But then, they will prevail. We read in our devotion, Conflict and Courage, page 68, paragraph 4 and 5, when in his distress Jacob laid hold of the angel and made supplication with tears. The heavenly messenger, in order to try his faith, also reminded him of his sin and endeavored to escape from him. But Jacob would not be turned away. He had learned that God is merciful and he cast himself upon his mercy. He pointed back to his repentance for his sin and pleaded for deliverance. As he reviewed his life, he was driven almost to despair, but he held fast the angel and with earnest agonizing cries urged his petition until he prevailed. Such will be the experience of God's people in their final struggle with the powers of evil. God will test their faith, their perseverance, their confidence in his power to deliver them. Satan will endeavor to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that their sins have been too great to receive pardon. They will have a deep sense of their shortcomings and as they review their lives, their hope will sink. But remembering the greatness of God's mercy and their own sincere repentance, two things. You cannot just remember God's mercy and yet you've not repented. They remember two things. I have repented and God is merciful and they exercise faith. They will plead his promises made through Christ to the helpless repenting sinners. Their faith will not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered. I want to leave us with this thought. If we have unconfessed sins in our lives, if we do not have an abhorrence for evil, 
and come to this time of trouble. Confessing at that time will be too little too late. Therefore, I'm telling myself, what do I love in this world that is still sin? And I know what they are. I need to pray to the Lord, teach me to hate sin, that I turn away from it, that I will not carry my sins into that time of trouble when it will be too little too late. If I come to that time and I cannot point to my repentance because I am still engaged in the sin, the only reason why I'm pleading now and trying to turn away from it is because there is a punishment attached to it, I can see so, then I can see that the Lord will not hear my prayer, it will be too late. Now is the time for us to exercise that faith to get the victory today. Jacob had already exercised faith and he had gotten the victory over his bad character, transformation of character he had gotten. And that was why he could point to his deliverance, he could point to his confession, to his repentance. We need to exercise faith today in the word of God. God can and will give you the victory over your sin if you believe. Trust in his word, do what it says, and then you'll get the victory. So that we can come to that time, whether it's in our personal lives or the general time of trouble when probation will close, that we may come to that time prepared and will be among the people of God. Let us pray. Dear loving Father in heaven, we thank you that indeed power is guaranteed and that time to have the power is now. Your word said in the book of John 1 verse 12, As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And also says in the book of Acts 1 verse 8, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Lord, as indeed this power is guaranteed for us, we pray that we shall not fail of obtaining the power to live above sin. Teach us what it means to exercise faith since faith is the victory. Help us, Lord, to learn what it means to believe in your word, to trust in your word, and do what it says through your power, O Lord, not by our own works, not by our own strength, but doing your word because we trust in you that you can save us. Teach us how to do this. For lack of faith, we are failing. For lack of faith, we are still in our sins. Help us, Lord, to get the victory, I pray. Thank you, loving Father, for I know you will help us. Lord, take us through experiences in life that will teach us these lessons, that will etch it upon our memories, upon our hearts and our minds, that we will never forget it. Save us, dear Lord, and seal us with the seal of the living God, that we may bring the greatest glory to your name. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Thank you.